Frank. Also, the Pope decided today to release Vatican-related bath products. An incredible thing. Yes, it's the new Pope on a rope. It's right. Pope on a rope. Wash and let go straight to heaven. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Bill Roach, and this is another episode of Timeless Dialogues. Now, here's what I want you to consider. Weltanschauung Craig. You may be thinking, what in the world does that term like even mean? Now, we're used to hearing about this concept of Weltanschauung, specifically people who are involved in the apologetics world and the concept of worldview. You have Welt, which is world, and Altschung, which is the concept of view, so worldview. But what about the last word? Because you know how Germans like to operate. They like to pull different words together and you know, make these long, strung out conceptual things that you just keep reading and reading and reading. Well, we understand the idea of Blitzkrieg, which is lightning war. So when you look at Weltanschauung, the idea is, is that it's something that's akin to worldview war, or we're going to look at this, it could be something like psychological warfare. And so much of what we find today is, is this very concept. Namely, we're living in a world of, of psyops, where there's psychological warfare taking place. And if you can manipulate the way that people think and function and operate, you can control so many different facets of society. And I think we're all familiar with this. And I think some of the main ways that we've seen this is, is that we recognize that there are things such as isolation or fear or anxiety, or all these different mechanisms that can be used as a means of controlling one another. And you know, there was a time where these things sort of just seemed like abstract concepts to me, sort of just like ideas that people that don't have much to talk about would discuss. And then all of a sudden, 2020 came into the picture. And we saw how all of these different people jumped on all of these different bandwagons out of fear of COVID or arguments over masks or issues related to how do you deal with systemic racism and George Floyd and BLM and the protests and the riots and all the rest. And you saw this notion of people who were truly under this notion of Weltanschauung Krieg, this idea of worldview warfare, where you saw not just ideas being sort of battle, but you were also seeing just this psychological attacks that were given to people on how do you position yourself? How do you relate to this? How do you deal with somebody that might see you as a, a bigot or somebody that might see you as a racist or some other concept like that? Because what we realize is, is that if somebody can use one of these tools or one of these tactics in order to control you, they're controlling the narrative, which brings us to the topic of today. How does this issue of Weltanschauung Craig affect us today? And here's what I want you to see, is that you can use self-censorship as a form of censorship, or censorship as self-censorship. So notice, you don't have to actually censor people. You don't have to actually remove their free speech, or you don't actually have to kick them out of the business. You don't have to actually remove them and isolate them from society. You don't actually have to shun them. You just have to make them fearful of all of those types of things. Now, don't get me wrong. I realize and I recognize the fact that isolation and shunning and kicked out of businesses and removed from Facebook, Twitter, and all the other social media has occurred. But when you just sort of look at the projections of the figures and the numbers that are out there, you have to ask yourself this question. Are more people actually censored or are more people self-censored in a way that they function as though they are actually censored? And it's funny because if you really look at it, you really try to see how people function and operate. I think more people are actually self-censored more than they are censored. And why is that? People are so fearful of not being in cahoots with the mob that they're going to do whatever it takes to actually fall in line with the mob. So there's two different ways of getting people in line. And we're familiar with this. You know, you can have people where you're going to force them all to do the same thing. And I use an analogy from my youth in this sense. So I grew up and we did farming in the Midwest. And one of the things that we did is you would have cattle. 
and you'd have to move them from one field to another field. And I remember one time my dad was there and he kind of like almost made this proverbial bet. And he was like, boys, I bet you that I can get all those cattle to move from that field to that field easier and faster than you can. So we went out there and we tried everything we could. We tried to, you know, come from behind and use scare tactics and use all of these different things. I remember we were like, oh, we'll get the car. We'll do this. We tried everything we could possibly think of. And all it did was it scattered the cattle even further to the point where we were like, okay, this is, this is just not going to work. We can't get the mob, the cattle, to do exactly what we wanted. My dad was laughing and having a good time. But here's one thing that was really funny. This is what he did. He then came through and he walked over to one of the little like bales of hay that we had. And he grabbed something that was like not very big. And all of a sudden he holds it up. And my dad used to use this, this really funny little things where he would say the word like here calves and be like, here calves, like a very farmer-esque way of doing it. And he held it up and he used the natural instincts of the cattle to want to go after food. And he, no joke, he moved them like a hundred yards from one field to another. Now they were in one field. He actually got them out of the fence, hundred yards down into another fence area. Why? He was able to control the way that they could think in a psychological way in that sense, using their, their natural instincts in that regard for food as a way of controlling them. In one sense, this is exactly what we're facing today. So many people are acting as though, well, we're not being controlled by the mob. We're not being controlled like cattle. When the reality is, is that if we look at this concept of Weltanschauung and this idea of worldview warfare or psychological warfare in that regard, we find that if they can get you to self-censor, you might as well be censored in any way, shape, or form. So if you're just too afraid to put things on Facebook or Twitter or you know, put a sign out in your front yard or say something in public, well, then what's the difference from you not doing any of those things? like being told not to do those things, or they come to your house and they remove those things from you. We realize is that what's, again, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Or another way that we've put it is, is that there are two ways that you can touch your nose. You can take the direct route or you can go all the way around. The direct route is just not allowing people to say certain things. The indirect route is to self-censor. So here's what I want you to realize is, is that if we look at this concept is that isolation can be used as a means of totalitarianism. Now, I want to sort of plug a book here that um, actually James Lindsay recommended on Twitter, but he also sent it to me through like a, a Facebook message saying, this is a very good book. And here's what it is. It's titled, titled The Weaponization of Loneliness. And the subtitle is How Tyrants Stoke Our Fear of Isolation to Silence, Divide, and conquer. And the name of the author's Stella Morabito. I hope I said that right. Every time I hear Stella, I think of that Seinfeld episode, Stella. But the point that I want you to think of here is that this fear of isolation, this fear that is so intuitive within us of being separated from the group, being out of conformity, is a driving factor for so many people here. Now, I want you to look at a few things here. I actually pull up two different quotes here, and I'm just going to read them. Um, I know sometimes we can put the quotes up, but I want you to, to just look at this, this concept of loneliness. And the author says this, I finally concluded that there is a machinery at work, a machinery of loneliness. Now, continue listening here. It says, tyrants operate that machinery, wittingly or not, in order to disarm those they wish to control. It happens all the time in toxic workplaces or in destructive cults, as well as in politics. Now, it goes on to say this. I think we understand these phenomena instinctively. Unfortunately, most of us do not understand them consciously. That's a major failing that cries out for our correction. We must become more aware of these dynamics to develop counter strategies that can preserve our freedoms. And then she goes on to say, I hope this book can aid that awareness by laying out some of the patterns of the weaponization of loneliness. Now we're gonna look at this book a little bit more, 
here. But we have to see one of the major things that she's trying to get at is this idea of conscious awareness of things that are taking place. And I think sometimes we realize these manipulations that happen through isolation or through different psychological tactics that people use. Now, some of the things that we can look at is that totalitarians can get self-censorship as long as people believe they can escape the fear of social isolation. And the point that she's trying to get at is that social isolation can be used as a weapon and social isolation is a way to erode freedom. So we recognize sort of the, the psychological effects of isolation. And in particular, she talks about two very key things that have happened. And she talks about one with this woman named Jeannie. Now, Jeannie was somebody, she actually starts the whole book out with this. And it says, in 1970, a 13-year-old girl was discovered in my Southern California hometown after her depraved father confined her for a dozen years to a dim black bedroom. So this was an event that happened. It actually picked up things in the Los Angeles Times where this girl named Jeannie, or at least that was the name that was given to her, was suffering from this fact that this tyrant father had isolated her to the point that nobody talked to her. The other siblings knew about it. The other parent knew about it. And nobody actually would engage with her. She was just forced to be isolated. And then she goes on to talk about the net effects of this and the, the psychological effects is that this person was basically nonverbal, had no social interactions with somebody. It, it's a pure and total mental breakdown, like in every sense of the term. So the point is, is that self-isolation, or we recognize actually isolation, can be a means by which you can use those as controlling axioms of a person. And the interesting thing is, is that a lot of tyrants and a lot of cults will use this. Now, I think we see it with cultic mentality the best. And, you know, you think about it with, say, something such as the big cults, like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness. And I think about specifically um, some stories I've heard about Jehovah's Witnesses, where, you know, if you even defect from this, you're shunned from the group. And people live in this fear, the weaponization that can be used through censorship of speech or controlling axioms of who is in control or issues of, you know, you can't step out of line from the party. We're aware of all this, but what about other ones that we've seen? Say the, the Jim Jones sort of sex cults that are out there. If you don't perform these various acts or if you don't participate in the way that we're going to ask you to be, you know, an active member, well, then we know the net effects of it. You are going to be banished. You're going to be lonely. You're going to be isolated. And part of the thing that she's talking about is, is that loneliness or this social isolation actually can give us different forms of psychosis within our lives. And we recognize how psychosis and psychological things can work. But one thing that she also goes on to talk about is, is that we live in a society that has this great fear of isolation. And you think about this, you know, we've all heard of people who separate from society. They have nothing to do with their family. They have nothing to do with people that they know, that they have nothing to do with the greater culture around them. And they kind of go nuts. They fall into a psychosis. And we're going to look here at a few of the other things, but we live in a society that's just found a, a heightened form of that, where you find that people lose real interaction, that this psychosis and es escape are all used as means of controlling people or you are already controlled. Now, I, I want to flesh that out a little bit. We recognize how addictions work, where you know once you fall under the, the prey of it, the addiction can radically control you in ways that you're not able to, to free yourself from it. And one of the things that she talks about in this book is that psychosis is something of which it can form an addiction in us, specifically these self-isolating forms of psychosis. And she talks in particular about how social media can be a form of that, how you get sucked into the social world, how you're constantly having to click into this social world, and in that sense, you're being controlled by that social world. Now, what I want to look at here is, is that 
there's a few other things that it talks about here and that she talks about this notion of social isolation as a means of control. And one of the things that we, she looks at is, is, you know, cults and banishment, but also issues of what about colleges and the notion of thought police. So if you want to remain in our group, if you want to remain active with us, then you must, in many respects, not fall prey to this social isolation. So how do they control you? It's through the fear of social isolation. So it could be things like, well, if you don't say what we want you to say, then you're denied tenure at the local college or, or whatever it may be. There's also this mob mentality of the faculty. Of, you know, if you don't fall in line with what the faculty wants you to do, then, well, you can be socially isolated. And it's interesting because, you know, I've worked in the college and university systems, and this is really a true thing. And I think what we find is, is that there were a lot of people specifically, I find within my context, within 2020, you know, we're dealing with conservative evangelical colleges that were just overtaken by the woke movement and the social pressures. Oh my goodness. To conform to wokeness and systemic racism. I remember there's this guy who's now a local pastor and I made this comment about how um, systemic racism is not factually established. Now we understand what systemic racism is. It's sort of the, the essential feature of, of wokeness ideology that's out there. Literally it's a, the explanatory feature by which they sort of filter all things in society. And this guy came out, systemic racism is 100% true. In every sense, systemic racism is 100% true. And I, question the thesis and the guy went berserk about it. I mean, they, I mean, everything turns into it. It's literally sort of the, the racism of the box, you know, deus ex machia, the, you know, God of the box. You can't explain it. Well, well, God did it. Where did this come from? God did it. Well, why is everything bad today? Racism of the box? Well, systemic racism. And it, it affected churches and it affected seminaries and it affected you know, parachurch ministries. I remember all these people coming out with their moments of lament that they had during 2020 about the people of the majority culture and all these different things. But what it is, is it's a form of social isolation. If you don't buy into it, well, you're going to be shunned. And it wasn't just, you know, the, the proverbial racism of the box. Within evangelical institutions, it was the, you know, the church two movement. It was the fear of if you don't do exactly what the caring well material wants you to do, then you're going to be removed from the denomination. Now, it's funny because there were a lot of people who had situations where they knew what they were doing wasn't the right thing for their church and the people within their church, but out of fear of social isolation or the weaponization of loneliness, isolation, Velton John Craig, as it relates to loneliness, people did some of the most ridiculous things. So I want us to look at just a couple more here. So one of the other things that she talks about is, is this is exactly how like large scale regimes work. Stalin and the Soviet era tactics, Germany's media and its different propaganda, Mao's struggle sessions. And you know what's interesting about Mao's struggle sessions, even with all of these really, was the fear of being labeled. Because if you were labeled, then you would be isolated. And the isolation brought loneliness and the tactics that came about with it. So here's what I want us to do is I want us to see sort of the, the key theses that come about from this. And I want us to look at the, the reality is I got a few things here where she talks about how this works, like mob mentalities and group mentalities. And it functions with identity politics, political correctness, and mob formation. So identity politics, separation into groups, Political correctness, what you say and you cannot say, the censoring of speech. And then how do they enforce it? They use the mob. So if they can get you into a group, they can censor what you can say, and they can use a psychological force to control you. Namely, the group's going to come after you. These all function as major struggle sessions. Now, what's interesting is, is that some people say, well, I don't see them showing up at my house. Now, I saw them showing up in the downtowns of 2020 or right now in the protests that are taking place over Israel and Palestine and Hamas and all the different things that are taking place. But we do see how they work 
in a social media world. And that's one of the things that she talks about is that given the internet, you can have the greatest potential for the largest scale of group think, group identity, political speech, group issues of, you know, political correctness, all of which can happen instantaneously all around the world in a variety of different ways. And what we find is, is that the struggle sessions today don't necessarily take place at your doorstep. They take place on the internet with people trying to control you. Now, what I want to do is, is I kind of want to look at this concept that she talks about here. And I want us to give what I consider it up to this point, probably one of the main theses of the book. And this is coming in the biggest form here. And it says, nevertheless, the methods and goals are the same, namely, this control of people. It says it all begins with isolation. The totalitarian can easily induce, induce self-censorship as, as long as people perceive it as an escape from the fear of social isolation. Notice, notice this. The totalitarian can easily induce self-censorship as long as people perceive it as an escape from the fear of social isolation. And yet, by self-censoring, we cut ourselves off from others and thereby become more isolated, not less. This self-imposed isolation due to fear of isolation is our greatest enemy because it is being used to erode our freedom. So notice this. We have this fear of isolation. We don't like it. We know the psychosis of it. But what we do is, is out of fear of being isolated, we actually isolate ourselves more by self-censorship. Why? Because we cut ourselves off from meaningful conversation with other people. We cut ourselves off through self-censorship and become more isolated. We, out of the desire to not be, you know, purged from the mob, we give up our freedoms all out of the thought that if we don't keep in, in line with this group, we're going to lose our freedom. And what's interesting is, is that she then goes on to you know, share a whole host of different ways that, that people fell prey to this. You know, the COVID issues and how they used loneliness as a psychological mechanism with people during this time. You know, literally people were lonely and they wanted to get back into society. One of the things that we found is there was extreme forms of coercion used. Welt and Chung Craig, you know, put on the mask, wear the mask, stay six feet apart and all the rest. But also she talks about how it functions as this, you know, means of social conformity of which this Hydra effect took place. Notice it wasn't just coming from one area or one person like Stalin or Mao or, you know, Hitler. Rather, it was coming from corporate America you know, social media, from the government, from all the, the different things. And the point is, is that these entanglements from all of these different ones gave us a form of self-made slavery. Now, I don't want to talk about everything here. She goes into a, a whole variety of means of how this worked, but it's interesting the way that they were to literally affect virtually everything through that mechanism. So I want to read just one here. She talks about, you know, issues related to how COVID got us to change so many things through group mentalities. And she says this, due to social distancing mandates of COVID-19, only 30% of votes were cast in person. State and local officials had eliminated nearly 21,000 in-person polling places. The results of the push for mail-in voting were so vast and so unwieldy that many Americans expressed concerns about irregularities in voting, vote tallying and oversight. The, those concerns were treated with scorn and censorship by big media and tech who enlisted virtual mobs to do the thing or the same. Again, as she says, the COVID-19 mandates gave their inner petty bureaucratic license to berate their fellow citizens in stores and in parking lots and in elevators demanding to know vaccination status or to mask up. So she goes on to talk about this in just a variety of different ways. and. You can get the book, you can start to go through it, but what I want you to see is this, is that the ultimate issue is, is that they can control you. They don't have to literally put you in chains to, to control you. 
They can control you by self-censorship. They can censor you by the fear of isolation. They can censor you by the fear of loneliness. They can censor you. They can take away many inherent freedoms that you have longed for and fought for just by the idea of separating you from the herd. So what I really want to do over the next coming weeks is I want to spend more time looking at this issue of Weltanschauung, and I want to look at how these different tactics can be used as a means of manipulation. So one of my favorite little quotes that I've seen that came from probably one of the, the greatest individuals that I've seen working on this, namely James Lindsay, he gives us this little line, this little stanza that I think we need to use. He says, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I see. I know that manipulation, it doesn't work on me. And this is precisely what we need to see these as. They are true manipulation. Once you see them, or as, as Stella talks about, once you become conscious of them, they lose their effects upon you. So what I want to do is I want us to look at these issues of controlling manipulation, this Weltanschung Craig, this worldview warfare. Because again, if we know what we're talking about and we know what we see, once we learn the manipulations, they will no longer work on these. So we can still play with it. So again, thank you. Appreciate it. We're going to continue looking at this going forward. 10,000 years will give you such a trick in the neck.